One, two, three. Like this? Do you hear me? <laughs> Hi everyone. It's great to see that so many of you came instead of watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of Harvard College Effective Altruism. A student group committed to the idea that we should apply reason and evidence to do as much good as we can. This talk is part of our fellowship series uh, in which a, a group of students attends weekly dinners uh, and talks with guests such as Peter Singer, Steven Pinker, or Darren Asimoglu. Uh, if you are interested in the idea of effective altruism or in the idea of having dinners with, with such luminaries, don't forget to fill in uh, the feedback forms, uh, which is the easiest way to get in touch with us. And also don't forget to attend our upcoming events, which my co-president Angie will tell you about. So this week, from April 12th to 17th, Monday to Friday, is our first Harvard Effective Altruism Week. Um, during this week, we'd like to encourage you all to think about your values and visions for the world, and then also think about how we can translate these intentions into effective actions. Tomorrow, we have an OCS career panel on earning to give. Uh, Tuesday, we have MIT economist Darren Achimoglu on uh, states and rights. He's the co-author of Why Nations Fail. And last, we have a competition for a career coaching package from 80,000 Hours, which is an organization that helps find the ideal career paths for people to maximize their positive impact on the world. And last, to introdu introduce tonight's guest, we have Professor Josh Green uh, of our own Harvard Moral Cognition Lab. Uh, Peter Singer needs no introduction, but that's not going to stop me. Uh, it's uh, it's it, the, the simplest way to, to summarize uh, the, the long list of things you might say about Peter Singer is that he's hands down the most influential living philosopher. And when I say that, I don't just mean living philosophy professor, someone who has a PhD in philosopher. I really mean one of the most influential living thinkers. Uh, and not only is he influential, I mean, you know, there are a lot of bad people who've been influential, but he's been influential <laughs> in the best possible way. I don't think that there's anyone whose ideas have had a more uh, positive impact on the world in, in, in my lifetime. So you know, to, some of the, to get some of the basic biographical details out, so Peter Singer is widely credited with being one of the founding people of the animal rights movement or the animal liberation movement. And he has made important contributions and has had very sort of groundbreaking ideas about almost every, a, a, every aspect of, of bioethics and really ethics more broadly. Um, but the, 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 the line of work, the line of thinking that really brings us here tonight uh, to me, is the one, at least the one that has had the, the, the biggest impact on my life. So it goes back to a, a paper that, that Peter published in the early 70s called Famine, Affluence, uh, and, and, and Morality. Uh, and he made a, a very simple and compelling and yet radical argument. He said, if there was someone who was dying right in front of you, you would be a moral monster if you just let that person die. This is a child who's drowning in a pond. And yet, there are lives that we could save all over the world, and we don't think that we're monstrous for not doing anything about it. Um, now, I, I actually encountered this idea, someone described this, this question or this problem, this dilemma to me in high school, and I, I could not get it out of my head. Uh, and I kept thinking about it and thinking about it, and then a couple of years later, I got to college. I was an undergrad philosophy major here, and I, I, I read his book, uh, Practical Ethics, and then later, later re read that paper, and I was like, oh, this is the guy. This is where, where this all came from. And it wasn't just that one idea, but this whole set, this whole coherent framework, this whole approach uh, as Alice said, of, 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 of applying reason and evidence to the problems that, that, that we face. Um, and part of what's been amazing to me is to see the change that's happened even over, over, over my own lifetime, over my own career, in terms of the influence and receptivity of, of, of Peter Singer's ideas. I mean, he's always made a splash, he's always had a following, but I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. When I, when I, was, when I first read Singer as, as, as an undergrad, uh, 
It was someone who was put in front of you to say, well, clearly this can't be right, but it's interesting to figure out where he goes wrong, right? <laughs> and I was sitting there in the back of the room saying, I think he's right. Uh, and, and, and I know this sounds kind of crazy, and I'm not sure that I can live up to the standards for myself that this implies, but I can't really see the flaw in the argument. And, and then it stayed with me, as I said, over time, and, and, and really became the driving force, not only behind so much of what I've done professionally, I'm a, I'm a philosopher and I study moral decision making, but also personally as well in terms of how I, I allocate my, my, my own resources. So uh, Peter Singer has been a hero of mine for a long time, but more importantly and, 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 and delightfully, increasingly he seems to be a hero of more and more people and, uh, and, and his good works and good ideas seem to be, to, to be spreading and spreading. Uh, there was never anything like this uh, when, 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 I was on, when, when I was on the other side and it seems that uh, you know, the, 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 his influence keeps growing and growing. Uh, so he, he spent some 30, 40 years trying to convince the world that we in the affluent world, we who sort of mostly by luck, by, by, by privilege, have this power to dramatically improve the lives of, of, of people we don't know. And he spent a long time trying to convince people, often a great uphill battle, that this is something we ought to take seriously. This is something we ought to act on. And now I feel like we finally entered phase two, where there is a, a, a critical mass of people uh, who say, of course, of course that, 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 that seems, seems right. And you know, there's a, sort of a, a snarky and somewhat cynical saying we have in, in academia, we say the, the ideas advance one funeral at a time. Uh, and <laughs> that's not true, but there's a grain of truth to it, which is that sometimes when the right ideas come along, the world isn't quite ready, at least most of the world isn't quite ready. And, 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 and what I see now is that the world is increasingly ready for uh, these ideas to take hold, and I think that that's where that's why the effective altruism movement uh, is, 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 is taking off now, and there's really no more positive development that I can imagine for the, for the world of ideas or for the, for the world at large. So we are uh, here to hear about uh, Peter's new book, The Most Good You Can Do, How Effective Altruism is Chasing, I Changing Ideas About Living Ethically. Uh, as I've said, Peter Singer is, is, is one of my great heroes, and I'm sure to, to many of you out there, and I'm delighted to hear what he has to say and to have him here on our campus. Please welcome Peter Singer. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, that was a truly great introduction. I love the way you presented uh, this sort of uh, battling uphill for 30 to 40 years and uh, a sort of late flowering of uh, people taking the ideas not simply as uh, an interesting philosophical puzzle but perhaps as something to live by. I think that's a, a wonderful thought and uh, certainly the number of people in this room and the great audiences that I've had in the last few days that I've been promoting the book does suggest that something really is happening, that there is uh, an emerging new movement of people wanting to actually live uh, the ideas of effective altruism. So let me get on with talking about that and uh, some of the things that I have in my first slide. I think uh, Alesh already said, he more or less gave you the... Uh, the definition of what effective altruism is, um, but here it is as presented by that authoritative source, Wikipedia. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, again, I mean, it's a sign of the relatively newness of, of the idea that I think probably two years ago, maybe there wasn't a Wikipedia page about effective altruism. Uh, it's, it's a, it was around that time that uh, somebody thought this would be a good thing to have a page of, and uh, a lot of the organizations that are represented here that have been uh, sponsoring or associated with this talk uh, were also not around very much long ago anyway. Maybe uh, something like GiveWell, I think, dates around two, 2007 and uh, uh, 80,000 hours, perhaps a year or so later, and the uh, Center for Effective Altruism later than that. So we really have a lot of things that are coming together. Um, and therefore, as, as Wikipedia says, this is both a philosophy, that is a, a philosophical outlook, um, although as I'll say in a moment, a fairly broad one, and uh, a social movement. Uh, and applying evidence and reason to determining the most effective ways to improve the world is what it's all about. 
But you then might say, well, what is the most effective way to improve the world? Or rather, what do we mean? Let's start with what do we mean by the idea of improving the world? Uh, and that's where the philosophy starts to come in. There clearly have to be some values behind this idea of wanting to improve the world. Could mean different things to different people. And I think there is some kind of common core to what effective altruists take to be improving the world, although there's certainly a certain amount of, of diversity within that as well. So here's a suggestion as to what that might be. Uh, it's adapted from a blog by Holden Karnofsky, the co-founder of GiveWell, and I'll say a little bit more about uh, GiveWell and Holden later on. I've, I've uh, tweaked it a bit in ways that um, I seem to me to be slightly more accurate, but it's, it's broadly based on, on what Holden said. So, um, take a universal perspective. That is, we are concerned to improve the world, not just the bit of it that we happen to live in, or some other small part of it. Um, you could say, philosophers sometimes use the term cosmopolitan to distinguish somebody who wants to have a global ethical perspective from someone like a communitarian who wants to focus on their particular community. Uh, so, uh, effective altruists uh, are cosmopolitans in that sense. But you might then say, well, what are their major values? What do they think is going to improve the world? And the second line suggests, again, as I say, the kind of common core of what I would see effective altruists regard as improving the world. So reducing suffering is uh, something that I think pretty much everybody would agree would improve the world, certainly taken in itself. This doesn't mean that all suffering is on balance bad. Um, some suffering may be necessary to reduce to prevent further suffering. Uh, we might go to the dentist knowing that we'll suffer a little, but otherwise we'll suffer more. Um, and there are more major examples than that too. But the suffering in itself is bad and we would rather not have it. And of course there's a lot of suffering in the world, so if we can reduce that vast quantity of suffering in the world, we've done something good. Similarly, premature death is bad, at least the premature death of beings who can hope to have a good life, where um, the prospects of a reasonable life are, are there, or perhaps where somebody wants to go on living anyway, then we think it's a bad thing if their lives are cut short prematurely. And again, there may be other things that we would take into consideration here, but uh, this is certainly something that we would normally think of as bad. So that's all about the idea of, of well-being, promoting well-being. Now, uh, the next point is one that I think there is some variations on in range of importance among the effective altruists, and that is, if we say that suffering is bad, do we only take into account the suffering of human beings? And I'm pleased to say that I think pretty much everybody in the effective altruist movement would agree with me that species in itself does not determine the badness of suffering. That is, it, it can't be just the fact that you're a member of the species Homo sapien that means that your suffering is bad. The suffering of members of other species is also bad. I put in the how much with a question mark to indicate that there is some disagreement here about how you weigh that suffering of animals against the suffering of humans. Um, and I think the best way to understand this is not, is not that it's questioning whether similar amounts of suffering are equally bad when it happens to a human or an animal, but rather it's questioning how do we know how much animals really can suffer as compared to humans whom we can talk to and who can tell us what it's like for them. So I think I'd be surprised if there's anyone in the room who really doubts that a pig can suffer, for example. But um, if somebody says for a breeding sow to be locked 
in a stall too narrow for her to turn around or even walk a single step, which is the situation for still, unfortunately, I think the majority of the breeding sows that produce pigs in factory farms. Um, if somebody says that's just as bad as a human being locked in those conditions, well, we might well disagree about that. We might say it's not the same for various reasons because of their different cognitive capacities. Both of them matter, but can the, can the sow suffer as much as a human? That's, that's a question where I think there is room for disagreement and room for further discussion and investigation. Now, um, the next line is also one where I think you would generally find in the effective altruism movement that people think that principles like justice, equality and fairness and perhaps also some moral rules matter to some extent or ought normally to be given weight. You might say it's kind of a pro tanto sort of thing that uh, if two courses of action one will better promote equality, justice and fairness then that's what you should do. But not necessarily that they're overriding nor even necessarily that they're intrinsically important. That is, I think quite a few effective altruists, maybe the majority, would think that they're important because they tend to promote well-being. Because a society that recognizes principles of equality, justice and fairness is likely to be a society in which people have better lives. And then there would be some debate, I think, as to whether, apart from that, these principles are intrinsically important, whether they matter in themselves. And some people uh, would say that they would, and some would say they wouldn't. And I think those who say that they would could still claim to be effective altruists as long as they are also giving weight to well-being. So they might say, yeah, there's some kind of trade-off if something, one, one action is just and the other is unjust or less just. As I said, pro tanto, they might want to do the, the just one, but if it was clear that there was going to be much more suffering in the long run, if they did that, um, then they might think that this was outweighed. Or take the question of, of equality. We might normally think that helping the worst off actually promotes greater well-being because we can usually use our resources more effectively to help the worst off. And indeed, that's what I'll be arguing when I talk about global poverty in a few moments. But should we help the, help the worst off even if it were clear that we could make a bigger gain in well-being by helping people who are not the worst off, but somewhere in the middle? Followers of John Rawls would say no. I think most effective altruists would say well, possibly, if the gain in well-being were big enough anyway. Um, so uh, I think that's something, again, on which how exactly you make that trade-off, whether you give weight to the fact that some are worse off than others independently of trying to improve well-being would be something where there's some disagreement about. And finally, I think effective altruists would hold that we should seek to maximize expected value. So very often people will say, look, what you're talking about are setting up programs and uh, organizations of various kinds that are directed towards the future. Some of these to the quite distant future perhaps. But how can we know exactly what will have the best consequences? Especially when we project into the future, but even in other cases as well. well we all know about aid programs, for example, that have gone wrong. So what we want to maximize is the expected value, or what we should use as a basis for our choice is expected value, in the sense that if one action will have a big payoff, but there's a significant probability that it won't happen, and we're comparing that with another action that has a smaller payoff, but we're much more confident that it will happen, what we want to do is to discount the payoff by the probability of whether it will happen or not. So a 10% chance of gaining 100 units of well-being is on this view equivalent to the certainty of gaining 10 units of well-being. Uh, and as I say here, uh, some people would say, well, um, 
there are some moral rules that are absolute side constraints. That we, never, we, we ought not to do some actions if they violate a moral rule. And again, um, I don't want to exclude such people from the broad umbrella of effective altruism. What I'm saying here really is I don't think you have to be a consequentialist or a utilitarian in order to be an effective altruist because you could say there are some things that I would not, not do no matter what the consequences. There's a famous example in uh, Brothers Karamazov about um, would you torture this child here if that was the way to produce happiness on earth forever after. And some of us, utilitarians, and I count myself as one, would say, well, it would be very hard to do psychologically to torture this small child, but after all, I would have to think that if I don't do this, there will be thousands or perhaps millions of small children who will be tortured brutally in various ways uh, in the world in the future, or perhaps they'll die painfully of all sorts of illnesses, whereas I now, fantastically, have the chance to stop all that by just torturing one. So I would say, uh, I would hate to have to do that. I don't know whether I psychologically could, but I would think it would be the right thing to do. But um, if you say no, that would always be wrong, as Dostoevsky seems to be saying, or has Alyosha saying in The Brothers Karamazov, I think you could still be an effective altruist because most of the time you're not going to be asked to torture a small child, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> So you can go on maximizing utility in all of those other circumstances. And, you know, there may be a few other rules that you would want to keep as well. Okay, so that's a rough account of the, the key values. Now, where does this come from philosophically? I do just want to pay tribute to a nine, late 19th century utilitarian philosopher that probably those of you who have not studied ethics will not have heard of, and unfortunately even some of you who have studied ethics will not have heard of, because your professors will have made the mistake of giving you John Stuart Mill to read instead of Henry Sidgwick. Although Mill is admittedly a better writer, he also wrote a much briefer essay about utilitarianism than Sidgwick did, but Sidgwick is certainly the better philosopher. Um, so, having got that in, um, this, this line from Sidgwick, I think, is, is basically his basis for what I had before about taking a universal point of view. He thinks that it's a kind of self-evident truth, a truth of reason, he would say, that um, the good of one individual is of no more importance than the good of any other. He says from the point of view of the universe, but he doesn't really think the universe has a point of view. That's, the, that's what the, if I may say so, in brackets is about. It's a kind of a, a metaphorical way of putting this. Um, so uh, that's, you know, those philosophers who are kind of objectivists about values might agree with Sidgwick that this is a truth, a uh, moral truth. Some others would want to say no, but it nevertheless is a fundamental attitude that I, that I hold and that I encourage others to hold. There's a variety of views on the nature of ethics here. But I think something like this lies behind the idea of effective altruism and its universal stance. Okay, whoops, sorry, a bit too fast there. I want to now talk about some of the people in the movement who've been influential in starting the uh, effective altruism movement over the last few years and getting it going. And I think uh, I uh, give a lot of credit to Toby Ord here, um, who is the founder of uh, Giving What We Can, uh, one of the groups that uh, there are people representative of um, here, I think. Um, and Toby sort of, I guess, began his thinking about it in this way. He was uh, doing a, a doctorate in philosophy and headed for an academic career, um, but he was still living on his graduate studentship. I think it was about 14,000 pounds a year. And he felt that it was really enough to give him a reasonably good life. He didn't need a lot more than that. Um, but he realized that, presuming he did go on to have an academic career, he would be earning more over that career. So, being mathematically inclined, he decided to work out, firstly, how much he would be likely to earn over his entire career, and secondly, how much he would really need to live on over that career. And uh, he worked out, I think, that he would uh, earn something like uh, 1.7 
million pounds at the current values of a, a few years ago, uh, and that he would be able to give away, I think, two-thirds of that. Or maybe two, the two-thirds was the 1.7. I can't swear that. You have, to, you have to get the book to check the figures. I've got them right in the book anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, he worked out that th there would be this uh, quite large amount uh, of money that he would be able to give away. He then decided to think, what, how much good could that do? And he decided to look at how, how many operations could be performed to restore sight to people who are blind. So one of the common causes of blindness is cataracts. Um, people, as people get older, they very often get cataracts. And I'd be surprised if there aren't many people in this audience whose grandparents or parents have had cataracts uh, and had them removed. And pretty much, I would say, everybody in the United States who goes blind or even has impaired vision because of a cataract will have it removed. Either their health insurance will pay for it, or if they don't have health insurance and they're poor, uh, they will get it on Medicaid, or uh, since most of them are probably 65 or above, they'll get it done on Medicare. But throughout the world, there are millions of people who do, cannot afford and do not have access to services that will remove cataracts. But it's quite an inexpensive operation. The marginal cost of doing an extra cataract operation um, seems to be somewhere between $25 and $100. Um, so you can divide whatever the figure was, if it was 1.5 million pounds, which would be more like, I guess, uh, over two million, two and a bit million dollars, you can divide that by 50 or 100 dollars and you can easily see that this is a very large number of people whose sight could be restored by your, give, by Toby's having given that element of his salary that he thought he didn't need to organizations that were effectively working in this way. So he was surprised by that. He thought this was an immense amount of good that he should do. And he therefore pledged to live on a somewhat similar modest amount, 18,000 pounds a year, um, which uh, of course gets adjusted for inflation as the years go by. So it's probably already a little bit higher than that. Uh, and he is now following that academic career as a uh, research fellow in philosophy at Oxford. Um, I also point out that he's not a hermit living in a cave. He's a married guy with a mortgage and he now has a child uh, as well. Um, and his wife has made a similar pledge. Um, it's not as if he's living off a, uh, a wife who's an investment banker. Um, uh, so I think, I, I think her pledge is, is roughly in the same sort of, sort of ballpark. Um, so uh, this is an example and, and Toby then decided to tell more people about this, so every people ought to know about how much good you can do with a relatively small amount of, of uh, you know, even with a relatively modest income. And um, so uh, he set up this organization, uh, Giving What We Can, together with Will McCaskill, who you see here, uh, who helped to found it. Um, and uh, the Giving What We Can website gives this kind of information. I'll say more about that in a moment. Will also founded uh, this organization, which I think there's a little thing about there, 80,000 hours, uh, named for the number of hours that Will calculated the typical person would spend on their career. So the idea of calling it that was to make you appreciate that your career decision is an important decision that's worth thinking about. If you spend a bit of time thinking about what you're going to do in the evening or something like that, or where you're going to go on your vacation, um, then your career is a much more important decision, obviously. And yet quite a few people just more or less fall into a career that seems convenient without thinking too much about it. And uh, Will was, is trying to encourage people to think about this from an effective altruism point of view. That is, to think about careers that will effectively help to make the world a better place. Um, just two other things before I come back to that. Um, firstly, uh, Will has actually just got an appointment as a fellow at Lincoln College in Oxford, so from next year he won't be a junior research fellow in Cambridge anymore. Um, secondly, uh, he's got a book coming out this year as well um, called Doing Good Better, 
and I've seen the proofs of that, and I think it's an exciting book, which um, is certainly uh, doesn't clash a lot with mine, but develops other aspects of effective altruism. So I hope you'll look out for that when it, when it comes out. <clears throat> okay, this is the website, 80,000 hours, that... Um, 80,000hours.org that will set up. And uh, as you see, it is intended to provide career guidance. Um, now, Will thought when he looked at websites that do talk or that provide career guidance, and when he looked at what they say about to people who want to live an ethical life, um, I think he thought that it was pretty trite, really. It was fairly obvious sort of stuff that was not necessarily the only options. So it was saying things like, uh, well, you could work for, a, for an NGO, um, uh, find an NGO that's doing, doing good work, uh, perhaps an aid organization, for instance, and you could work for them, or you could go to medical school and become a doctor and work in a developing country. Um, those are good things, and they're fairly obvious, and probably most people would be able to think of them. But will thought that a lot of people would not think of deliberately choosing a career that would bring them a high income. So, for example, I mentioned investment banking a moment ago. Investment banking typically does bring high incomes. Could it also be an ethical career choice? Will's view was, yes, it could be, if you were going to use that income in order to do more good. So, whereas Toby Ord, say, is going to be able to donate as an academic uh, maybe a million and a half pounds over his career, uh, a successful in investment banker a few years out of uh, into their position could probably donate that in a single year if they wish to do so, and every year thereafter. So, if you would do that, you could do a lot of good. And will argues that what you have to think about in considering whether you do more good as an investment banker than as an aid worker is the marginal difference that your career choice will make. So by the marginal difference, think of it this way. Suppose that you decide that you're going to be an aid worker and you see that Oxfam, Oxfam America, who actually have their headquarters just here in Boston, um, are advertising for a position in their office. So you apply for that position and let's assume that you get it and you work hard at that position and do a good job. How much difference have you made? Well, you can't say that the difference you've made is all the good that you've done while holding that position. Because if you had not applied for that position, presumably the next best candidate would have got the job. We're assuming that Oxfam have a reasonably good set of criteria for deciding who is the best candidate. So the difference that you're making by getting the job is the difference between the good that you do and the job that the second best candidate for the position can do. And if there's a strong field, and very likely there would be, that's going to be a small kind of difference, not really a huge difference. Now, consider that you instead go into investment banking or Wall Street in some other way. In one sense, the same thing could be said. What you do for your employer, for the corporation, the extra good that you do, is only the marginal difference between what you can do and what the second best applicant can do. But as an effective altruist, you're not really interested in doing the most good for the investment bank that you're working for. You're interested in doing the most good for the world. And it's very unlikely that the second best candidate for the investment banking job would donate as much of their income to effective charities as you as an effective altruist would do. So everything that you donate as a result of earning a high income is additional. Additional to what would have happened if you hadn't taken that job. And that could easily be enough to fund not just one but two or three or more positions at Oxfam or at some other aid organization, where all of the good that the people in those positions do 
would really flow from the fact that your donation had made it possible for Oxfam to employ those extra people. Now it's true that not everybody is going to really be able to do that. For one thing, not everybody is going to be able to get a high paid job uh, in finance or one of those other high paying sectors. Uh, so you may not simply be able to do it in that way. But also, there are people who may not have the character to stick at something where they're not directly interested in what they're doing in doing the best for the company they're working for, but they're really doing it for what you might say is an ulterior motive, although in this case, a, an ethical ulterior motive to help as many other people as possible or to do the most good that you can. But I think some people can do this, and here's one of them. If you read Nicholas Kristof's column in last Sunday's, no, not, well, not today's, but a week ago's New York, uh, New York Times, this is the man he wrote about, Matt Wager, who was uh, a student of mine at Princeton and started thinking about these kinds of issues um, and made a decision, I think not, uh, not at all just because of the course he'd taken with me or discussions he'd had with me, <laughs> but, um, but because of other people in the community uh, around Princeton and also at, at Rutgers at the time, there was a, an EA kind of group, rather, as there is at Harvard, and talking a lot to people there. Um, Matt, who seemed to be headed for an academic career, he'd um, done well in philosophy. He got the philosophy department's prize for the best senior thesis in his uh, final year and uh, was offered a place in the graduate school at Oxford University. Um, instead of taking that, he decided to take a job at an arbitrage firm uh, on Wall Street. So. Um, this slide is a little bit old, he's now a couple of years after graduating, but uh, in the first year already, he was able to give a six-figure sum to the charities that he regarded as most effective and, and still have enough to live on um, very comfortably. Uh, he also set up, helped to set up an organization that uh, spun off uh, the previous book I wrote related to global poverty called The Life You Can Save. So um, I had Matt back last year to uh, the, the, the class that he'd taken, talking to the students there. Um, and he was asked uh, whether there wasn't a danger in backsliding. And probably this is something that you will have already thought of, many of you. Um, here he is, working on Wall Street, surrounded by people who are earning as much as he is or more, and he's spending that on essentially a very comfortable, more than comfortable, luxurious, style of living. Um, they're probably driving Porsches or Ferraris or something. They may be buying themselves penthouses in Tribeca. Um, and isn't Matt getting envious of this? Doesn't he think, uh, yeah, you know, maybe you really do need a Porsche after all. Um, <laughs> so Matt's response was that uh, so far he hadn't really um, been tempted to adopt their lifestyle. And moreover, that by being public about what he was doing, and he talked about it in a variety of ways, and uh, uh, gave me permission to talk about him in, in the book, and obviously spoke to Nicholas Kristof <coughs> for last week's column, by doing that, he feels he strengthens his own commitment to doing it. Because now, if he backslides, he's going to look a lot sillier than if he hadn't actually told anyone about what he was planning to do. So. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good psychological strategy, I think, to uh, keep yourself, to tie yourself up to the mark and not allow yourself to get corrupted over time. Okay, here's someone else who actually is here in the audience, Julia Wise. Um, and Julia is an example of, of a different approach, um, perhaps a little bit more like Toby's, although not coming out of philosophy, but uh, just out of something that, that she always thought was right, even from when she was a teenager, that uh, she was fortunate to have so much and there was, if she was spending money on herself in some way, she was taking it from someone living in poverty elsewhere in the world and uh, as far as, as reasonably possible, she ought not to be doing that. So uh, she and her partner, Jeff, um, who was here but seems to have gone off with a child, um, uh, 
gave a third of their income even when they were earning less than $40,000 a year and living around this area, which as you, some of you may know is not the cheapest part of the world to live in. Um, and now that uh, they're earning more, fortunately, they're able to give more. And if you want to read more about uh, Julia's thoughts and her lifestyle and how she does it, um, I highly recommend you look at her blog, Giving Gladly, which you can find the address there. So those are some examples of people in the effective altruism movement. I could go on for a long time. There are many, many more, but I think you get the idea and I do have a few more in the book. I now want to move to looking at uh, one of the deeper philosophical issues that lies behind or the, cause, the choice of a cause that effective altruists can make or will make. Um, and this is something that people also uh, very often disagree with about, but um, I think it's, it's an example of how effective altruist thinking has the potential to change a very large industry in the United States. And that industry is philanthropy. It's very large because the total amount given to charity in the United States each year is, is around $335 billion. It's about 2% of uh, US GDP. So it's, it's, a, it's a big slice. And of that, the majority, about $240 billion, is given by individuals. Most of those individuals do no research at all into the charities that they donate to. It's only a, a minority who do any, and that, by any research, that really can be extremely fleeting. Look at uh, the website or information provided by a charity. So if we can change that and make that $240 billion go to the most effective charities that there are, we will be making a huge difference to the world. Because as I say, this is a very substantial amount of money. Uh, it's something like more than 10 times the amount of US foreign aid, for example. Um, so we're talking about a lot of money here. And this is an example of the, what is still the mainstream approach to charity. So this is from the website of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Uh, a large player in the field of advising wealthy people about philanthropy. Uh, and as it says under the Your Philanthropy Roadmap, giving away money is simple, giving away money effectively is an entirely different matter. And I think everyone in the effective altruism movement would agree with that. But when you probe more deeply into what RPA means by giving effectively, I think disagreements will start to open up. So you can probe more deeply by looking at a kind of online brochure that they have called Finding Your Focus in Philanthropy. And it pictures the field of philanthropy like this, which I think has a couple of mistakes in it from the start. Firstly, it, if you look at this chart and think, which area will I give to? you're missing a really important question, which is, will I give to organizations working in the United States or in my own country if I'm an affluent citizen of another country, or will I give to organizations working in developing countries? So that's, uh, that choice is not really presented here. I mean, you could say, well, you know, economic security, I could give to economic security here in America or in sub-Saharan Africa, or uh, health and safety, I could give to improve healthcare in, in uh, India, or I could give to improve healthcare here. Uh, those will make very big differences to the effectiveness of what you're giving. The same with education. Uh, but it's not shown here. The other thing that I notice here, um, given my interest, as uh, Josh said in introducing me, in uh, questions about the ethics of how we treat animals, is that animal welfare doesn't even get into this picture at all. There's really no category here um, in which somebody concerned about reducing the suffering of animals, at least reducing the suffering of animals other than wild animals in the natural environment, because I guess that could fall under the environment heading. Um, uh, that doesn't, doesn't seem to get in. It's just, just excluded by the initial picture of, of philanthropy. 
But that's not my biggest problem with RPA. It's rather what they say here. They say, what is the most urgent issue? And they then answer this question by saying, there's obviously no objective answer to that question. Uh, first, I don't think the question to ask is really what is the most urgent issue. It's rather what is the issue in which you can have the biggest impact. Because something might seem very urgent, like there was a hurricane in Vanuatu not very long ago. You might say it's very urgent to get supplies there. People need help right now. But it's quite possible that that's not the most effective way of helping people in great need. It might be that there are ongoing areas of concern, like the deaths of children by diarrhea all over the world, caused by poor drinking water or the lack of oral rehydration therapy, where you can actually do more good for your donations than helping people in Vanuatu. That's going to depend on the particular of the situation. But there are GiveWell, if you look at GiveWell's website, which I'll again talk about in a moment, you'll see some suggestions that humanitarian relief is not always where you can make the biggest difference. But the larger problem is this claim that it's obvious that there's no objective answer to that question. I don't think it's obvious at all. In fact, I think, on the contrary, it's obvious that for at least some choices, some are objectively better than others. In other words, there are choices where I think it's not that difficult to say one option is objectively better than the other. There are others where it gets more difficult, although I think perhaps there still is an objective answer, even if it's very difficult to reach it. Let's look at a couple of RPA's examples and see whether one is better than the other. So RPA talks about Ted Turner's $1 billion donation to the United Nations to scale up already proven health programs against killer diseases killing largely children in developing countries. So diarrhea, malaria, measles, these sorts of things. Now at the time when Ted Turner gave that, there wasn't much working, there wasn't much being done, and it's been estimated that the cost per life saved was as low as $80. That's not saying that by giving to these programs today, you can save a life for $80. Um, certainly the current research being done would show that the cost would be significantly higher. But that's because, you know, if you go into a new field, you go to the areas where the disease is most prevalent, where you can immunize children at risk most conveniently and easily, and therefore the cost per life saved is lower. Once you've been doing that for 15 years, it'll go up. But compare that with RPA's, another of RPA's examples, and I was lecturing at Stanford just uh, a couple of days ago, giving a similar talk. Uh, so this is a hospital that was set up in Palo Alto by Lucille Packard. Um, Palo Alto, if you don't already know it, is, I think, ranks as the third most affluent community in the United States. So it isn't like there is a great number of unmet medical needs for relatively simple, inexpensive procedures. Um, and among the things that the hospital has been in the news for is spending between one and two million dollars to separate a pair of conjoined twins from Costa Rica. Now, that's a good thing to do, but if you can save a life for $80, or even if, let's say, you can save a life only for $1,000, or maybe even $2,000, to spend $2 million to separate one pair of conjoined twins doesn't seem to be the best use of your money. You could have saved, let's say, at least 1,000 lives for that. And it's better, I would say, to save 1,000 lives than to separate one pair of conjoined twins, even if the twins would have died had they not been separated. And I don't know whether that's the case or not. So that's an example, I think, where you can make a choice because you're talking about fairly simple, similar things, saving lives and so on, um, at different costs for doing so. Let me give you an, another example that was in the news just the other day. Um, David Geffen, who um, uh, is an entertainment mogul behind DreamWorks, for example, um, donated $100 million to what uh, may still be, but won't be for long, called the Avery Fisher Hall at the Lincoln Center in New York. Um, no prizes for guessing what it's about to be called. 
And $100 million, incidentally, is not the full cost of renovating the hall. There was some debate as to whether he got a bargain in getting the naming rights because the Lincoln Center says it will cost half a billion dollars to renovate their hall. So the question, and, and presumably they'll raise that from other donors, but in smaller amounts. Um, the question here really is, what else could David Geffen have done with that amount of money? And uh, among the things that he could have done is, again, restore sight or prevent blindness. Um, I mentioned cataract surgery. This is preventing people becoming blind, not from cataracts, but from trachoma, which is the leading cause of preventable blindness in the world. It's caused by a microorganism that gets in the eyes of children when they're quite young, in, uh, living in certain conditions, generally people in, in poverty. Um, it's a very slow, progressive condition. Gradually, their vision will become blurred. And uh, as they age, they will become completely blind. So typically, given the life expectancy of people in poverty, which is less than ours, but maybe 55 or 60 or something like that, typically they'll be blind for about 15 years. So again, this is something that can be very inexpensively prevented by a simple treatment, uh, ranging similar sort of costs from the cataract surgery, maybe 25 to 100 dollars per case of blindness prevented. So if you're giving 100 million dollars to a concert hall uh, renovation, then that's a million cases of blindness uh, that could have been prevented. And I just think it's, it's obvious that there is an objective answer that that would be a better thing to do than to improve the concert going experiences of those uh, wealthy Manhattanites and uh, other visitors to New York City who will go to concerts in the Lincoln Center. Um, now, uh, when I've said this, people have sometimes commented, um, well, David Geffen has also given to medical research. He gave to UCLA uh, Medical School, for example. Um, in a sense, that's, that's not the point, because even if he did other things that were more good, here's $100 million that he didn't do the most good that he could have with. And as effective altruists, I think that he should have done the most good he could with all of what he's prepared to donate. Uh, so this is, effect, this is um, expressing this kind of view uh, about the arts in uh, comment on the Christoph column that I mentioned um, in the Times just last week. Um, so it's sort of saying, well, what I'm doing here, because Christoph talked a little bit about that as well, what I'm doing here is um, playing off the arts against uh, other areas of human experience, reducing poverty, and why don't we do both? Well, my response to that is, if you've got a bank that will allow you to write a check for everything in your account to reducing global poverty, and then will write another check for exactly the same amount to the arts, uh, and will pay off both checks, please tell me who you're banking with, because I want to switch to them as well. We only have a certain amount of funds, and it's not a false choice, it's a real choice that we have to make what to do with those funds. Okay, uh, I want to say a little bit about effectiveness. I want to make sure that you have time for questions and discussions, so I'm going to whiz through this pretty fast. Um, here's GiveWell's website. Um, this is the organization that introduced a new rigor to assessing the effectiveness of charities. Until GiveWell got set up, um, around 2007, the, o the only thing you could find out really online about charities was what percentage of their funds went to administration and fundraising and what percent went to, pr to programs. And a lot of people still think that that's a key factor in deciding which charities are the best ones to give to. But you don't have to stop and think very long to realize that it's not. Suppose that you have an organization that is very concerned to cut its administrative costs and so has very few staff and therefore can say truly that only 10% of the funds it receives go to administration and the 90% goes to its programs. And suppose you have another organization that spends 20% on administration 
and only 80% goes to programs. Does it follow that the first is a better bet? Not unless you know that its programs are equally effective with the programs of the other one, or at least very close to equally effective. But you don't know that, and in fact the fact that they've got fewer staff means that it's quite likely that they won't be, because they don't have so many staff to decide which are the best programs, to carefully research which programs they're going to fund, and then to monitor and evaluate whether the programs they're funding are, are working. So it's quite possible that 90% of your funds will go to programs, but those programs will only do, let's say, a tenth as much good as the programs, a tenth as much good per dollar as the programs that uh, the organization that gives 20% of its administrative expenses, uh, of, its, of its revenue through administrative expenses, is going to fund. So then the second organization would be a far better bet. So what GiveWell does is actually look at the impact that the programs have and try to find independent evidence, for example, randomized trials of some places where these things have been done and other places where it hasn't been, the sort of gold standard of research into pharmaceuticals, to see what really works and what it costs to get what kind of benefits. So this is the website, the first stop to go to if you're looking for effective charities. And GiveWell decided that global poverty is the area that trumps the others in terms of being effective. And really all of the charities that it recommends are working in the global poverty area to help the global poor. Um, as this suggests, uh, they don't really recommend very many charities at all, but if you get the impression from that that you know, all of this, whatever that is, looks like at least 95% are actually useless, that's not the case. What they're saying is um, it's only the, this small wedge of charities that have demonstrated to us with sufficient rigour that they are highly effective and highly cost effective. Some of these may also be highly co cost effective, but they can't really prove it to us. They haven't got sufficient evidence. And some of them may not be effective. And we just don't really know for sure which are which. There are other places to look as well. Here's Giving What We Can, the organization founded by Toby Ord that I've already mentioned. And here's The Life You Can Save, which uh, I've also mentioned, the one that spun off from the book that I wrote. Um, and uh, The Life You Can Save also recommends charities. It has somewhat wider criteria than Give Well. And uh, I won't go into the details now, but I'm happy to if somebody wants to raise a question about why we have somewhat wider criteria. <clears throat> okay, so let me say a little bit then, just this is the last section, about why, why is it that uh, people become effective altruists? Some of you here are already part of the effective altruist movement and you probably know the answer or you know it about yourself anyway, but many of you I expect are not. So you might say, why does somebody set themselves the aim of doing the most good. Um, and when I say set themselves the aim, I don't mean that everybody in the effective altruist movement is trying to do the most good with absolutely everything that they do throughout their life. That would require a degree of sainthood that very few of us are actually capable of, and I certainly make no claims of that sort. But I think effective altruists make it a significant part of their life to do good to do the most good. And there's been some debate already about, well, what do we really mean by significant? Uh, say, if people are comfortably off, middle class or above in an affluent society, do they have to be giving 10% of their income? Do they have to be giving, as you've seen some people do, 50% of their income? Uh, where do you draw that line? And I don't really want to draw a line, I must say. What I want people to do is to say, yes, I want this to be one of my goals. I'm going to start somewhere and I'm going to see how I feel with that, whether I feel comfortable with that, whether I feel good with that. And if I do, I'm going to work up from there. So if I felt comfortable with that this year, then next year I'm going to do better. I'm going to do more. And I'm going to build up from that point. And I think if you set out in that way, I think you can happily consider yourself uh, an effective altruist or on the path to becoming an effective altruist. So what motivates people to do this? There are many things, and again, I don't have time to, to go into all of it. But I rather like this quote from the Canadian philosopher Richard Keshen, 
His book's called Reasonable Self-Esteem, and the book is in part about the importance of having self-esteem. And psychologists generally agree that self-esteem is an important part of well-being. That if you have high self-esteem, then you're more likely to be satisfied with your life, to be happy, to be fulfilled. And Keshen, um, again saying something a little bit like this idea of the universal point of view that I mentioned with Sidgwick, um, that a reasonable person has to recognize that the well-being of others is equally significant with their own well-being. And therefore, a reasonable person cannot have self-esteem while ignoring the well-being of others. If you can at least easily make a big difference to the well-being of others at a minor cost to yourself, or perhaps even at no cost to yourself, then it'll be a problem for feeling good about yourself if you don't do it. So here's somebody that I knew from the animal movement who um, I think had exactly that sense. Henry Spira is the man who is probably most responsible for the fact that today if you use cosme cosmetics or hair shampoo or something of that sort, um, those products were not tested on animals. Um, and many of them will state that. Um, at the time when he began his campaign on this in around 1980, they were all routinely tested, for example, by being put in concentrated forms into the eyes of rabbits. Um, so, I, uh, Henry was a, was a friend of mine from the beginning of his campaign, um, and I wrote a book about him called Ethics Into Action. Uh, and at the time that I was working on that book, Henry knew that he didn't have very long to, get, to live. He had a, a form of cancer that was not treatable. But he was actually very calm about the fact that he was facing death, and uh, he was calm about it because he felt he'd used his life well. Because uh, he felt that he'd done good in the world and he'd actually enjoyed doing good in the world. As he says here towards the end of this quote, it's not a sense of duty, but rather this is what I want to do. I feel best when I'm doing it well. And I think, again, there's a lot of psychological research that suggests that people who are generous or who are committed to non-selfish causes feel good about that, feel good about themselves. It's the, uh, if you like, the, the recent empirical validation of what the ancient Greeks called the paradox of hedonism, that if you aim at your own pleasure, you don't find it, but if you aim at something else, you often do. So my last slide is uh, of... Uh, the founders of, of GiveWell, I mentioned Holden Karnofsky before, here's his co-founder, Ellie Hassenfeld. And um, they found, when, at the time when they set up GiveWell, they were working for a very successful hedge fund. So they were making a lot of money, and they set up GiveWell because they and a few others wanted to give away some of that money. They were still quite young and they wanted to give it away, but they couldn't get enough information to decide to which charity to give it. Remember, they were hedge fund analysts. They were used to getting a lot of data for their hedge fund to make decisions as to which corporations it should invest in. And they wondered why, when you wanted to give to charity, even if you told the charity that you were not just going to give them 50 or or $100, but that you would give them ten or $20,000, even if you told them that, they still couldn't provide you with good data to show why that amount of money would do more good if given to them than if given to someone else, or why it would do even just, you know, what particular good it would do. So they set up GiveWell and moved across to it, taking a very sizable pay cut for themselves, because they were now working for an NGO. So I regard them as uh, good examples of effective altruists, and they've been highly effective, as I say, in now channeling tens of millions of dollars to more effective charities through their website and through other websites like The Life You Can Save, The Draw and their research. And they're really happy with the decision they made. They're excited by the work that they do. They're excited by the idea of making the world a better place. And uh, you couldn't say that they're just cold, irrational calculators. They are emotionally involved in trying to make the world a better place. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'm going to stop at this point, and we do have some time for questions. Um, we just want to say that if you're leaving, please do give us your feedback. Or 
have you got someone at the door? Please do give us your feedback forms. There's someone at the door to collect them. There's also donation tables and a chance to buy Peter Singer's book at that door. Uh, which I'll be happy to sign, by the way, if you do get a copy of the book. And there's also going to be a table of representatives from local and um, other EA organizations, such as GiveWell and 80,000 Hours, at this table. So please come up and ask questions, if you like, after the Q&A session. Thank you. You know, would you rather just take questions? I mean, I, I, I can ask a couple or, or moderate. Why don't, why, it, why, don't, why don't you ask a couple first to set things off, and then okay. Um, okay. You might. I don't know whether that one's working. Is that working. Let me see this. Oh, maybe the table mics are working, aren't they? Yeah, that's working. That's working if you hold it really close. Okay. okay. So uh, now I have an opportunity to, to, to have a discussion with, with Peter. I'll, I'll, I'll start us off, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to other questions from the audience. So uh, you've been talking about this a lot for a long time, and increasingly uh, the, these days. What do you see as the biggest obstacle to getting people to sign on, not just with, 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 with words, but with deeds to the effective altruism movement? Uh, well, I suppose, you know, I mean, you've studied human nature and, and psychology a, a lot, and I think there's, there's a fair amount of, I'm not sure whether they call it apathy or perhaps a feeling of impotence that people have out there about, can we really make a difference? Can, 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 I, can I make a difference? Uh, does it, and does it matter? And I think there's certain kinds of feelings that people have somehow that the problem is so big that I can't really make a difference. Um, I mean, I think that's a kind of a, a mistake because you can certainly make a difference to particular people like the people who, for whom you can pay for cataract surgery. But, but it seems that people are put off by the idea that even if I do that small thing, there's still going to be a lot of others who can't be helped. Yeah. So as someone who studies psychology and decision making, one of the most robust uh, findings in social psychology and the study of, of, of social influence is that people tend to do what everyone else around them is doing or what they feel everyone else is around them is doing. And I think part of what's so important about effective altruism becoming a movement as opposed to just a, 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 a set of ideas is that you know, one of the things may simply be that it just seems weird doesn't seem to be what most people are doing. And as you have more and more people who are doing it and talking about it and publicly committing to it, um, you know, that, that, that alone may, 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 may be an, an, an important part of it. Um, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about something you mentioned, uh, and, and that is why, about the broader criteria that, that, that are d deployed and the, the website associated with uh, uh, um, the life you can save. And perhaps this is related to a question that I've wondered about myself, which is how, how do you make, how do you analyze the trade-offs between things that are clearly important and easy to measure versus things that are also potentially very important but much more long-term, like education and political representation and things like that? Yes, that's, that's exactly one of the reasons why, um, although we greatly admire, I greatly admire what, what GiveWell is doing, um, I think you have to, have scope for other things. So uh, one of the organizations that I recommend, or that the Life You Can Save recommends, that Give Well doesn't, is Oxfam America. And uh, one of the things that they do is advocacy work. They do a lot of direct aid programs as well, some of which can be evaluated by randomized trials. But because they're big and diverse, uh, it's Give Well says, well, who knows what your donation will actually go to. Money is fungible. So you can't tell what it will go to, so you can't really tell whether it will go to a program that does have uh, a good evidential basis for saying it's effective or the, whether it will go to something else that doesn't. But among the things that don't have that evidential base is advocacy work for the global poor. And a lot of peop <coughs> people ask me sometimes after talks, isn't the problem structural really? Aren't there things that we have to change? For example, uh, the global trading system 
isn't really a level playing field for developing countries. Uh, very often they produce agricultural products which they would like to sell on the world market, but the US and the European Union subsidize their agricultural products which then make it much more difficult for uh, peasant farmers to, uh, to get decent prices for theirs. So what about changing this? So you need, I think, you need some advocacy groups and Oxfam is one of them. Now sometimes that's very hard. You might spend quite a lot lobbying to get the farm bill changed and so far those efforts have all failed. Um, but on the other hand, some of Oxfam's lobbying efforts have paid off quite handsomely. Um, I talk in the book about uh, working with civil society's organizations in Ghana. After Ghana discovered oil, uh, there was a question raised, so where would the revenue that the government was getting from oil go? We already know that in some African nations like Angola, uh, another excellent recent Nicholas Kristof column on this, by the way, um, uh, that, that the revenue seems to be going to a very small elite, uh, among whom is the daughter of the president, um, who is now the richest woman in Africa, although Angola has the highest child mortality rate in Africa. Um, so obviously you didn't want this happen to, to happen in Ghana, and, and uh, Ghana is definitely a better functioning, more democratic society with better functioning civil society. Uh, you can't compare it with Angola. But still, where would the money go? So the civil society groups lobbied for a program called Oil for Agriculture, which asked Parliament to legislate that 15% of the oil revenue would go to agricultural smallholders, to essentially peasant agricultural growers, to help them improve their agricultural performance. And that bill passed, and that means that many millions of dollars will go each year to those small, small farmers. And Oxfam put, I think, something like uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars into helping the civil society groups to lobby for that. So that's a huge payoff. Um, and it's very hard to predict whether payoffs will always be successful or not like that. But I think if, if it's a, an organization that has good people, uh, you know, trusted, experienced people that are working for this, um, I think it's a reasonable bet to support them. Let's open it up to, to questions. Um, do you want to take the mic to people more? So, um, yeah, go ahead. If you just wait till you get the mic, I think, yeah. Then everyone can hear you. So I'm interested in the point you made with uh, uh, Geffen. Uh, the, uh, the, the issue of, a, I think, a zero-sum game uh, is important. So when one person is making a decision about their own giving, it is zero-sum to some degree, uh, if they if they have a, an amount that they want to give. But when it comes to society as a whole, you said that there's 2% of GDP that's given, and that's by no means the, the cap. So the money that he's giving for the arts is perhaps separate from the money that he could be giving otherwise, and that's true more generally. I'm interested in uh, what you think of that. Uh, certainly, I mean, uh, I think we all would like to increase the amount that is given to effective charities anyway. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, I think it's worth saying, I wouldn't necessarily want to increase the amount given to charities just in the sense of uh, this is a 501c3 organization that you can get tax deductibility for. Um, and one of the things that actually annoys me about uh, the, the Lincoln Center gift is that you know, taxpayers are paying for, I, I don't know at what rate Geffen pays tax, but presumably it's 35% or more, it certainly ought to be. Um, so uh, we're paying for a substantial amount of that uh, renovation. Um, but if we put that part of it aside and we assume that the charities do more good than the tax subsidy would do, then yes, we could and we should perhaps grow the amount of, uh, of philanthropy that is given. And in that sense, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, but I suspect that the way it is now, um, it might be easier to get people to shift what they're giving already to more effective charities than to get them to substantially increase the amount they're giving. That's just a guess, um, and I could be wrong. And, uh, but still, it's, it's, it's as long as there are lo other low-hanging fruit in terms of the more urgent things, I still think it's going to be the case that it would be better if they gave it to those more effective charities. Um, if there are some things that they will either give to the arts 
or they will spend on you know, more sophisticated video games for their kids or something like that, um, yeah, sure, then maybe they should give it to the arts. But I wonder how many people are like that. Um, in, in the black and white sweater, black trim. <laughs> oh, well, all right, <laughs> that works too. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question regarding the role of the state or taxes in your whole philosophical mus musings of effective altruisms. Um, should charities be tax deductible? How do we reconcile this with sort of the taxes that we're paying anyway? Well, um, as I just sort of said, really, I, I'm, I'm happy for tax charities to be tax deductible, but I think the United States has an exceptionally broad view of what can qualify as a tax deductible charity. Um, and I think there'd be a lot that I would not want to see tax deductible. Um, an alternative would be not to have charities tax deductible at all, but to have more public money going for the causes that would otherwise be done by charities. Uh, if you look at European models, especially Scandinavian models, that's what you find. In Sweden, for example, charities are not tax deductible, but the government does a lot of things for which in the United States people rely on, on charities to do. So, um, you know, that, that's an alternative model, but I don't think the United States is ready to do that. Um, you know, it seems like no politician is prepared to say, I think we ought to raise taxes so that we can have better health care and better social welfare support. Uh, and in the absence of that, I think we have to ask charities to do quite a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, if I were, um, you know, if, if, if we could have it, that uh, taxation was more, more steeply progressive and uh, did more to uh, gain benefits for the poorest, both in this country and in other countries, uh, I'd be happy with that. But uh, I don't think that's realistic at the moment. Thanks for the talk. Um, one question you, you were m maybe uh, that's connected to your question as well. You, are you here in this room um, computing the trade-off that you're making between like making more money and giving it to, to the best, to the, its most efficient you know, uh, allocation and here like spending time with the, like, we, <laughs> us students, I don't know. Are you always, as an, as an efficient, effective altruist, always computing the best outcome and the best blah, blah, blah? Actually, so it would take a lot of time and yeah. a lot of energy. So, kind of, if not exactly, I guess. Somebody did ask me before about uh, how I chose which lectures to give, right? Which talks to give, given that uh, time is a limited resource. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, I speak, I guess, under a couple of conditions. One, one is I can address a large audience, uh, and particularly a large audience of people who, w who either are or are likely in future to be influential. And um, this was a large audience, and uh, as people at Harvard, I think you have a significantly better than average chance of being able to be influential and uh, to have more to give at some future stage, even if you don't have it now. Um, at other times, I, I speak when I'm offered a large speaking fee, which I will then donate to effective charities. So although I'm probably never likely to earn as much as a successful Wall Street trader, and I think I've missed my chance to have that career now, <laughs> um, there, are still, you know, there, there are still significant sums that I can move in that direction, and I'll, I'll do so when I, when I get that opportunity. Hi. Um, just on this question of Wall Street, and if I come back to, to the line of reasoning around 80,000 hours and, and Matt, as you think as an individual about making that decision about how to live your life, how do you think in absolute versus net terms of the amount of good that you're creating? And so the trade-off between I could make a million dollars and give it versus the value that I'm taking out of the economy, the communities and lives that I'm potentially destroying by rationalizing footprints and um, you know, things like that. So what is the calculus on absolute versus net? Good. Yeah, um, so I, th I think, you know, if you talk about questions of 
I, I take it this is what you're, you're getting at, that maybe as a Wall Street trader, I'm doing some real damage. I'm raising finance, for example, for a mining company which is going to destroy a rainforest or pollute a river that local people use for fishing or something of that sort. Um, that's, that's a possibility. Um, but I think the, the consequentialist and I think also the effective altruist way of thinking about that is um, what difference am I making, right? So again, if I hadn't taken that job, assume that I am working at Wall Street, would the person who would have got the job not have done what I'm doing? And I think the answer clearly mostly would be, well, they would have probably done it and more because I've, I'm aware of these ethical issues. Some other people are not. So if I see something especially egregious, I might go to the senior partners of the firm and say, look, perhaps this really goes beyond what we ought to do. Are you aware of these things? And you know, maybe martial arguments, including even arguments about the potential public relations damage to the firm in order to try and stop them because I'm an insider. Uh, someone else who doesn't care about that might, might not do that at all. Now there's a different ethical view which says, no, you're complicit in the wrongdoing if you're a part of that firm, um, even if someone else would have done it. Uh, that's, some people think of that as a kind of a, a, a Kantian view, and uh, Josh has done a lot of research about uh, the psychology that might lie behind that kind of attitude. Uh, I, don't, I don't hold it. Um, and and pe a lot of people are not comfortable with that. You know, they're saying, so, so does that mean it would have been okay to be a concentration camp guard if it was factually the case that if you had refused to be a concentration camp guard, you would have just got sent to the Russian front and someone else would have grabbed that chance because they didn't want to get sent to the Russian front? Well, um, it's a bit hard for me to say it, but um, yeah, I think that probably is the case. Um, so it's, it's a difference in, in different moral outlooks about this question of, of complicity versus trying to assess the difference you make. Um, sorry, you pointed to somebody else, but I guess I'm taking the question. Uh, uh, You've got the microphone. Hold on to it now. We'll yeah. pass it on to the other person. Yeah. Um, so th thinking about your idea from, from, from the 70s paper that the Josh mentioned, which is that most reasonable people would, would save a drowning child in front of them, and they ought to be doing the same thing for dying children across the world. Um, so would one, would one effective idea not be to actually make people aware of the suffering of people around the world? Um, do you think, so do any of the organizations do that? Um, and do you think that would be a good idea? But then another argument, if, 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 if reducing suffering is the goal, then being aware of suffering also causes suffering in a person. So then in that sense, um, and so some of these people who you, who you, you, know, who you tell about all these dying kids um, or sort of pictures of, of suffering, um, some of these people might give, but then other people might not give and just suffer themselves. So how do you think about this sort of? Um, uh, I certainly don't want to just cause guilt for the sake of causing guilt and make everybody feel bad about their lives because there are all these dying kids and they're not doing anything about it. The only point of telling them about it is so that they do do something about it and hopefully then feel good about the fact that they are doing something about it. But it's true that at least some people might actually be psychologically very troubled by the fact that they can't do enough about it and there are still other dying kids. So it's interesting. I mean, if you think about, we, we could really make the suffering of people in developing countries more visible. We now have the technology for doing it through the internet. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, for instance, has uh, founded this organization called internet.org with the aim of giving everybody in the world access to the internet. That's still some time off, but it's certainly the case that the internet is becoming more accessible, uh, more cheaply accessible in parts of the world where people are at a very different level of standard of living from what we are. So what will be the effect of this? I hope that it will be to make people feel that they're more closely connected with those people and that they can do something about it. But I'm not absolutely sure because it's possible that the size of the problem will still be daunting, that they'll still say, uh, I can't do it all. I mean, and that's in a way, you know, the, the, the example of the child in the pond works not only in that there's, the child is just in front of you and, and very visible to you, but also, I think, because there's only one child in the pond and you can save the child and therefore you can fix the problem. And of course, with global poverty, you can't. But 
in a way, if we could make them visible and then we could sort of divide them up so we could say, okay, so the Harvard community is going to particularly connect with this impoverished village in this impoverished country and when we've made them better off, we'll move on to another one. That might be a more practical, more satisfying way of doing it because you feel you have a particular responsibility and you actually feel you can achieve something. It's like, you know, there's lots of areas of life, I think, where we, we have these psychological strategies. Uh, if you're a gardener and you've got a huge patch of weeds, you might think, oh, it's just too much to do. But if I say, well, today I'm going to do this square um, and get that tidied up, you've got some satisfaction and then you move on tomorrow. Uh, who, who was the next person who was going? <laughs> Pass it along. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, just hold it close. I think it's on, but you have to hold it really close. No, it's not on. Yeah, it's uh, on. Hi, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, so I was wondering about your opinion about Benatar's claim that uh, presence, presen presence of pleasure is good while absence of pleasant is not necessarily bad. So you have mentioned that um, we want to, basic idea is that we want to alleviate this suffering. But there, there are, um, we're bound to suffer at one point in our life. And it seems to me that because I'm um, healthcare <laughs> oriented, um, I'm concerned about this um, adolescence. There's an increasing rates of suicide among adolescents, depressed adolescents. And it seems to me that um, by by ending the life, they they though the absence of suffering is good, but absence of pleasure is not necessarily bad. So I was wondering what your opinion about that was. Uh, at the philosophical level, I don't agree with that view. I think that. Pleasure is a good, and therefore the absence of pleasure is a good. And if somebody ends their life, perhaps in, in a state of depression, then whether that's a bad thing depends on whether they would have been able to come out of that depression and, and have a life of positive quality, or whether they just would have continued to suffer, in which case maybe suicide is a rational choice for them. Um, but I emphasize suffering in this talk because I think if we're thinking about what we can effectively do with our resources, we can more effectively target suffering than we can target maximizing pleasure. It's much harder to know what you can do about increasing pleasure, what particular donations to charities will increase pleasure, uh, than it is to know things you can do that will reduce suffering. And I think that's why we rightly focus in healthcare, which you mentioned, on treating the worst diseases rather than in trying to make people who are already, you know, okay, at least at a sort of neutral level, positively happy. Which is not to say, though, I don't think that, you know, the positive psychology movement does good, I think, if it helps people to feel happy. So we have time for one more question. Um, where's the mic now? Okay, there. Um, so how, from, from this side of the woman in the, in the red jacket. Yeah. Hi, um, how can you, de going off of, piggybacking off of his question, um, you define suffering, but how do you know that that suffering isn't what's considered a um, beneficial disadvantage? Uh, example, like blindness, for example. <laughs> but why, I mean, why would it be a beneficial disadvantage? You, you would have to tell me some story that, you know, in this particular case, it will be, there will be a greater benefit if this person suffers. Now, I don't believe in any kind of divine plan whereby somehow you know, a certain amount of suffering is necessary for people to get to heaven or some other creator's purpose. If I did, then I guess I would have to be, have a different view about this. Um, and of course, as, you know, as I, I said, there are certainly examples where some suffering is necessary to prevent greater suffering later. And some people will tell you individual stories of how suffering helped to build their character and enable them to succeed. But generally that's speaking, I think yeah. that's not the case. Generally speaking, I think suffering actually prevents people succeeding, prevents people from doing other things. 
um, prevents them working well and being creative. So I think that both in theory and in practice, it's normally a negative. If somebody ever some, you know, tells me, well, here it's not a negative, here on balance is a positive, then okay, I'll say, all right, then we have to allow it to continue. But you know, the default is, I think, that it's a negative. Thank you. Okay. Uh, d anything else you wanted uh, to say, or? So thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, please don't forget to turn the feedback form uh, and come to talk to representatives of the Tokyo Politics organization as well. Thank you. Make a talk here at the table. Uh, and if you get the book, I'm on the right. The, 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 what, what is Peter? What is the exact title of the book? The book is called "The Most Good You Can Do." I think it's for sale up over there. Okay, and I, I'll be happy to sign copies there if anybody go. wants me to. One more thing we'd like to mention is that Harvard University Effective Altruism, the grad student group, is hosting a social at Tory Row. So anyone 21 and over is welcome to join us there. And we're going to gather right over there um, towards the exit. Bill, who's waving his hand, is going to be walking over there. So follow him if you'd like to join us. Thanks. <laughs>